I'm going to invite you to open with me to Ephesians chapter 6. <coughs> oh, excuse me. If you're uh, using a pew Bible, you will find it on page 1160. Uh, we're coming to the end of our uh, look at Ephesians <coughs> uh, with a series that I am calling uh, Keeping Alert and Alive. And today we're going to look primarily at uh, verses 11 through 13. <coughs> I think we are, um, but uh, I'm going to read all of verses 10 through 20 uh, just to give us the, the bigger context of, uh, of what we will be looking at over the next few weeks. So Ephesians 6, starting at verse 10. Finally, Paul writes, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me, that whatever I, whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. Would you pray with me once more? Gracious God, thank you for your word. Thank you for Paul and the wisdom that you gave him as he wrote. And Lord, help us. Help us, to have eyes, help us to have ears and minds and hearts open to what you have for us this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In uh, Luke chapter 10, uh, Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. I suspect that most, if not all of us, know the story. There's a traveler who is attacked along the road, and as he is lying there uh, in distress, a priest walks by. Another religious leader walks by, and they both basically ignore him. And after they've gone by, a Samaritan comes along. And the Samaritan bandages the man up and then gets him into town where he can be looked at properly. Now, the term good Samaritan, I think, has lost much of its punch. We use the term today basically for anyone who might help a stranger in distress. We even have Good Samaritan laws to protect people who will help others uh, in case something goes wrong. We like Good Samaritans. What's lost is the scandalous nature of Jesus' story. No good Jew in Jesus' day, and Jesus was a Jew speaking mostly to Jews, no good Jew in Jesus' day would have helped a Samaritan, and no good Jew in Jesus' day would have wanted help from a Samaritan. The Samaritans were hated enemies. And so the fact that Jesus made the Samaritan the hero in the story would have been completely unthinkable to most people who would have heard it. And yet, in some ways, it shouldn't have been. If we go to Proverbs 25, 21, God says this. He says, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. There are some ways in which you could argue that the Samaritan in Jesus' story was just being a good Jew. I start with that 
because in our fractured society, it's easy to see other people as enemies. When I was at St. Olaf, the big football game every year was the Carlton St. Olaf game. I assume that's the big football game yet. And part of that is because Carlton St. Olaf crossed town rivals in Northfield. Now, when I was there, the rivalry was pretty much good natured. I wasn't on the Carlton campus a lot, but when I was there, I never felt threatened or in danger or anything. But there were stories going back a ways when that was not always the case. There were, there were stories from years past when the rivalry got ugly, very, very ugly. Good-natured competition is one thing, but there were times when things had, according to the stories at least, gone far beyond that. Matthew 12, Jesus says that on the day of judgment, everyone, and that would include all of us, everyone will have to give an account for every careless word they have spoken. There are a lot of careless words out there. And they go oftentimes beyond careless. They're false. They're mean-spirited. They're antagonistic. They're hostile. They are meant to humiliate, to harm, even destroy people. They're uttered online. They're uttered in the media. They're uttered in print. They're uttered in person. but they're not just words. Jesus said that it's out of the fullness of the heart that the mouth speaks. More serious than the words are oftentimes the attitudes behind the words. One way or another, they go beyond mere disagreement and even if they are not necessarily intended this way, they can communicate that so-and-so is my enemy. Coming from a little bit different angle, there are people who can seem or actually are hostile toward us at times, aren't there? And it may not come out outwardly, but we know that inwardly there is something about us that they do not like. Sometimes, sometimes it's because of our faith. And the reality is, as followers of Christ, we will at times rub, rub people the wrong way, not intentionally, but it happens. But other times it has nothing to do with the fact that we're Christians. It, it, it comes from some other reason. And the question for us in those circumstances is this. Are we hostile toward them in return? Do we see them as enemies? It can be easy to see people as enemies, can't it? Even if we don't put it that way. But seeing other people as enemies can forget who really stands behind all the turmoil. Whether it's in society generally or in our lives personally or some aspect of our life. Verse 12, Paul says this, he says, Our struggle is not, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. King James is actually probably closest to the original. It says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now, Paul here, of course, is talking about the, the conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan, believers, and, and the unbelieving world. The reality is, even though he uses that term wrestle, It's bigger than any Olympic wrestling match. This is a fierce, long, drawn-out conflict, not with other people, but with unseen 
forces that are lined up against us. William Peter Blatty, <clears throat> writer of The Exorcist, said that he didn't believe in God. But believing in Satan was a whole different thing. Now, that's kind of the opposite of what a lot of people, the way a lot of people would, would think. For many people, it's a lot easier for them to believe in, in God, even if they don't have an accurate picture of him. But when it comes to believing in, in Satan, that's the hard thing. But as Blatty said, the devil keeps on advertising. That's why he had an easier time believing in the devil than in God. The devil keeps on advertising, and he's absolutely right on that. I mean, we don't have to look too far, and we see Satan's handiwork kind of all over the place, don't we? Paul here is not just reflecting some ancient mythological world view, even though a lot of people would, would say that. Not true. People in the ancient world did believe implicitly in evil spirits, spirits whose whole purpose was to, was to do them harm. But let's be clear, the Bible believes in Satan and evil spirits. Paul believed in Satan and evil spirits. Jesus believed in Satan and evil spirits. And when we encounter people who are truly hostile to us or hostile to others, maybe, toward, maybe even toward God, we cannot at least ignore the fact that there is something else going on behind the surface that is egging them on because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. One writer put it, the spirit of any age is rarely found in alliance with the spirit of Christ. Having said that, it does not eliminate others' responsibility, or I could even say it does not eliminate personal responsibility. There are times in which I have said, I don't remember if I've said it here, but I know I've said it elsewhere, that 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 uh, people we see as enemies for whatever reason are not necessarily the enemy, they are victims of the enemy. And on one hand that's true, but it also could be just a little bit misleading if you take it too far because there is a sense in that they are victims of Satan's, Satan's scheming, either directly or, or indirectly. And yet, they and every one of us are responsible moral agents. We are responsible for the choices that we make. There are bad actors in the world. There are people who dislike us and others who would like to, or at least in some instances would be willing to, harm us for many reasons. But the fact that Satan lies behind all of it ultimately doesn't get them off the hook. Ephesians 6, I have often, I don't think I'm alone in this, but I have often lumped rulers, authorities, powers together with spiritual forces of evil. But as I was digging into this passage, I ran across some scholars who, who, who make a distinction. They think of rulers, authorities, powers in terms of human actors separate from Satan and demons. And I, and I would say that probably makes sense. Think back to Genesis chapter 3. After Adam and Eve ate the fruit, God confronts them. What does Adam say? Eve made me do it. What does Eve say? The devil made me do it. But notice that that didn't wash with God. He, he didn't give them a pass. They were responsible for their actions and those actions would have consequences. It's somebody else's fault doesn't cut it with God. And in, the, and, and, and in the case of Genesis 3, a curse fell on them, and of course it's fallen on the rest of us. 
But having said that, let me pull in John 3.17. We're very familiar with John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We need to go on to verse 17. Because in verse 17, Jesus says this, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Notice, God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. Think about how different that is from the perspective that so many people so easily have. It's easy. It's easy, but it's also dangerous to look at those who are hostile to us or particularly those who are hostile to the gospel or hostile to God, it is easy to look at them and condemn them. But that is not the gospel. That is not the gospel. The gospel is about saving us from evil, saving us from hell, not sending us or anyone else there for that matter. And it's a good thing. Because if we're honest, we all have issues. We all have issues. You've heard the old <laughs> adage about pointing your finger when you point one at somebody else. There are three pointing back at you. You may have also heard someone say along the way that things that vex us most about other people are often things we struggle with ourselves. But even if they aren't, even if they aren't, we all have things in our lives, things about us that God is not pleased with and that we and others would be better off without. Romans 3.23, Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All is not about somebody else. All is about us. Isaiah said, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. That's why the way we see others, the way we see others, even those who clearly have no time for God, that's why the way we often see them can be very short-sighted. Matthew 7, Jesus said, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And then he asked this question. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? The Bible does call us to be perfect, just like God is perfect. But it also is honest enough to recognize that it is a, that is a reality which we will not fully experience until we see Jesus. In the meantime, in this life, as Luther said, we are simultaneously saints and sinners. God's call on us is not to some unrealistic expectation of sinless perfection in this life is to honest humility about the fact that in this life we are far from perfect to strive toward perfection and to extend the grace to others, to cut them slack, just like we need slack ourselves. We still need to be on our guard. We go back to chapter 4 in Ephesians. Paul refers to the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. It's a reminder, as we already said, that there are bad actors out there. There are bad actors out there. There are people who have, who have no qualms about taking advantage of us, of misleading us for their own twisted purposes, even destroying us if we would get in their way. There are those people out there. That's a fact. But here in chapter 6, echoing something we've already said, it's not the cunning craftiness and scheming of people that Paul is concerned about. It's the cunning craftiness and scheming of Satan and, and his agents. 
Satan is real. He is not just some mythological or comic book figure. And that's why the Apostle Peter tells us to be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That someone could be any one of us. And while I can't point to a biblical passage that would say this, it does seem to me to make sense that the more serious we are about following Jesus, the more likely that we are to catch his attention. Why? Satan's attention. Why? Because the more serious we are about following Christ, the greater impact we're going to have for Christ's kingdom. And the greater impact we have for Christ's kingdom, the greater damage we do to Satan's kingdom. And when Satan gets threatened, he's like a cornered animal. And you know what happens when a wild animal gets cornered. It gets vicious. The instinct is to kill or be killed, and we need to take that seriously. We must be on our guard, but we must not lose heart. Picking up on last week's message, fear is not our friend. Acting out of fear rarely helps us make good choices. What does David say in Psalm 23? I will fear no evil for you are with me. Paul would say the same thing. Verse 13 in Ephesians 6, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. We're going to talk more about armor in a couple of couple of weeks, but for now, <clears throat> just notice what the assumption here is, that we can get through it, that we can survive, that we can come to the other side and still be standing, no matter what it is. I shared before a line from one of my former pastors about give the devil his due, but not, don't give him more than his due. Two reasons for that. One is simply that not everything we perceive as some kind of spiritual attack is in fact a spiritual attack. There are just things that happen in our lives and in the world because we live in a fallen, broken world. But more importantly for today's purposes and for the purposes of the next few weeks is the fact that we are not alone and that the one who lives in us is greater than the one who lives in the world. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus Christ is greater than Satan, much greater. We're going to look at that next week. So as we wrap things up here, let me put next week's text in front of us. It's verse 10. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Can you say that with me? Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. The battle is real. The threats are real. We dare not ignore it. But we also must not lose heart because greater is the one who is in us than the one who is in the world. And we can be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Amen? Amen.